everybody. This is Brother Frank, and welcome to another episode of The Remnant Call. I'm excited tonight because I have two wonderful guests that are familiar to you all on The Remnant Call here with me tonight, and that's Brother Jamie Walden and Brother Benjamin Brook to share some updates on what is going on in the world today. There's a lot of things that are out there in the mainstream, and there's a lot of things that are not in the mainstream with just a tiny bit of Googling you can find available out there. Um, you know, it's sometimes now it, your your searches are so I can tell you right now, folks, with Google is so um, censored. You need to search with other engines uh, out there. And I can I, maybe I'll do a program sometime, if, depending on how this country, world goes uh, on how to get around the censoring. But sometimes it can take three to four or five pages actually to get to any real news anymore and learning how to search. Don't just search for things using the exact title. You need to learn how to do abstract Googling or through other sites to in order to find certain stuff. But folks, it is getting real. Uh, it's getting um, scary, but it is not scary for those who are believers. The Lord promised never to leave us nor forsake us. And I'm going to, with that, bring on tonight, Brother Benjamin and and brother Jamie, are you all here with me? Yep, I'm here. Good to be with you guys. Amen. Yeah. Brother ben- hey, all right. Frank. Good. Yeah. Amen. Br- Jamie, um, since you're our guest, Benjamin's on. He's like family all the time on this show. So I'm going to ask brother Jamie, since uh, you're in here with us, could you pray for us tonight and get this program underway? Yeah, absolutely. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you and praise you, God, for your uh, immutable patience and your forbearance uh, with with just humanity, God, that you give us time to seek your face and time to repent, God, time to purify our camps and uh, be conformed to the image of your son. I thank you so much, Lord, for uh, even the shaking and the sifting that's going on right now in real time, because I know as, as many are being sifted from you, God, there are many who have been on the fence for a long time in their life or fighting sin, fighting carnality, fighting addictions, fighting the flesh who are being sifted towards you, God. And I'm so grateful to to be able to be a part of, of uh, cooperating with you as the Lord of the harvest. And I just pray tonight, Lord, that you would um, anoint our mouths and our minds and our hearts, God, that you would take a coal from your altar. I know know that I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. And I pray, Lord, that you would um, just take away our sins with the blood of your son and that you would give us the words to say that it wouldn't be uh, our bents, our biases or whatever, God, but that it would be in step with your spirit all the way. We know that we have nothing apart from your literal presence. So, uh, God, we will not be content for one of your heavenly hosts. We want your literal presence to go with us as your servant Moses did in uh, Exodus 33. So we just pray for your move tonight, God, that you would ignite the ears of those who have ears to hear, that uh, it would truly shape and conform their heart, not unto fear or not unto anxiety or not into uh, consternation and perplexities, God, but to to a soundness of mind, that sophroneo, that sound mind, and and that knowing of the sufficiency of your love made known in your son, Jesus Christ, that would drive out all fear, that there would actually be a thanksgiving, God, a rejoicing, although there's unknowns, that there would be a thanksgiving of, of the nearing of the day of the Lord, and uh, that our hearts would rejoice. Joyce, God, that your your throne, the foundations of your throne is righteousness and justice. And we can take solace in that and we can have a hope in that that will not never disappoint. So, Lord, just direct us tonight. Give us the words to say, restrain our lips for things that we're not supposed to say and speak to uh, until the appointed time. And we just pray, Lord, that you would bless this evening. And we pray all these things in the powerful life giving name of Jesus, our Christ. Amen. Amen. Hello. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Uh, fo- before we jump into this, I just want to mention quickly to our audience, um, folks, we are right coming up on the Feast of Trumpets, which is uh, starts off, kicks off the 10 days of awe and the days of repentance and uh, leading up to Yom Kippur this year. And so, folks, we want to take this. We want to make this one of the most uh, we, we want to make this the most important um, Feast of Trumpets ever from the standpoint of it's time to clean the heart and to get right truly with God in, in a dedicated, intentional way. And so, folks, we're going to do a special program, Benjamin and I, um, Jamie, brother, if you're available, but we're going to come on on Feast of Trumpets and uh, just, you know, let's open up this 10 Days of Awe 
time to fast and pray. And listen, if you can't, you know, I'm not saying everybody has to fast for 10 days um, with water and stuff, but if you, you can at least do the Daniel fast um, or something, you know what I mean? Like that. And let's get serious with our time with the Lord and, and truly empty ourselves out so that we can hear, we can hear clearly fasting is not a way that you, you get to, you know, say, Hey Lord, look at me. Fasting is a way to say to God, Lord, I can't do without you. I need to empty myself because Lord on my own, I am, I am worthless. And so folks, we want to encourage you to, t- to this year, let's be awake to this time like never before and take these 10 days with the most serious intentionality we've ever had uh, in our walk to date would be my prayer anyways. And so brothers, I just wanted to mention that as we get going, because I feel like you know, with everything going on, we can't neglect the one thing that can save us. And that's Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Benjamin and Jay. Benjamin, I'm going to let you get it kicked off here, and um, and uh, let's get going. I'm I'm waiting to hear from Jamie, but okay. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Things are moving fast, folks. You know, I almost feel like the Earth, our solar system, our lives have entered sort of the gravitational pull of a black hole, and you know as as you get closer and closer, once you've been sort of captured by that gravitational force, it pulls you in and it becomes stronger. The closer you get, the stronger it is and the faster you descend. And, and that's kind of where we're at. We, we've been locked on by a spiritual power of judgment and things are accelerating. They're happening at an even faster pace. The, the situation in the Middle East is about to explode Hezbollah put up the red flag of war today. Israel has been, well, we all know about the pagers and the cell phones and massive bombing campaigns. There was a massive missile strike by Hezbollah earlier today. That war is ready to go full tilt. I mean, it's, it's absolutely crazy what's going on. The government of Lebanon has announced that the Lebanese army will fight on behalf of Hezbollah. Syria has canceled all military leave. All vacations canceled. All troops ordered to return to their base. They're ready to mobilize. In Iraq, large paramilitary groups are forming that are heading towards Syria to fight with Israel. Iran, they've got missiles being loaded on mobile launchers so they can't be you know, eliminated by airstrikes very easily. Yemen is basically sending huge numbers of troops that are going to join the ground war. I mean, you know, this is the battle of Ezekiel 38. And and the Israelis know, you know, they, they've even made statements that what's happening is going to be biblical in its proportion. And, and they're talking Ezekiel 38, which is World War Three, which is the event that precedes the rise of the Antichrist, in which both Israel and America are attacked. America's in Ezekiel 38, verse 10. It's the other nation at the same time an evil thought will come into the mind of the enemies. Of Israel, and they'll attack another nation, dwelling securely without border walls, without any walls around their cities, who have great wealth and have and have lived in relative peace for the last 70 years. But now the war is coming to our shore. And yeah, we're here. I mean, it's we don't have months left, folks. This thing is slated to go down here in the fall of 2024. And oh, by the way, we're in the season of fall. So, you know. Fasten your seatbelts, as Frank was exhorting you. Fast and pray. You know, get your preparations done in the natural, but don't skip the preparations of the spirit because they are really the most important. Amen. I agree. Hey, but I want to say something to Jamie because this kind of ties in to what you were going to talk about with Benjamin was saying. But earlier, brothers, we were talking before we went on air. There's players to Ezekiel 38 that are out in the wings being drawn in folks. If you don't know who Meshach is uh, by now, you, you really should do in Magog. Um, you know, you might want to look up a little city called Moscow and, and all that stuff and look into ancient history and understand the players that are waiting to be baited in. Well, brother, you just mentioned Jamie. I think this is a, be a nice transition over to you about some recent things on the weapons cache and everything that just took place, actually bringing some of the big players uh, actually into war. 
Yeah, here, here's what's interesting about all that, you know, with, you know, we have we have Syria doing what they're doing. OK, we have the burden of Damascus that has yet to be fulfilled. We have Iraq doing what they're doing, which is very significant because we were talking off air that there's only been a partial fulfillment of the judgments against Nineveh uh, that God has laid out as well, too, in Isaiah. And then you have Iran, obviously, the Persians coming into, in, into uh, full view. But what's interesting is how Israel out of nowhere has made Russia a central focus of their enmity, you know, and, and what's unique even about that word enmity is that's a mutual exchange of uh, forcible hatred, bitter rancor or warfare. And to be an enmity with Russia, which historically Russia has always been a uh, to a degree, we'll say a protectorate of Israel because of the amount of of uh, Russian Jews, you know, and, and everything that happened with World War Two. So they've always had a unique kinship. And out of nowhere, Israel is actually uh, actively acting aggressively towards Russia to case in point that uh, Israel is in Ukraine currently right now, as of today, in Kiev, establishing an Iron Dome, the same Iron Dome system through Israeli tech companies, which will only be run by Israeli IDF and intelligence apparatus to protect Kiev against Russian missile strikes. So that's a pretty significant uh, uh, development that's just happened in the last 72 hours. Secondarily to that is, uh, you know, I'm sure most of the li listeners have seen, or maybe they haven't, so I'll just address it, but um, there was the largest conventional explosion, which was to the uh, amplitude of what of the nuclear weapon that was dropped on both Hiroshima and Nagasaki as far as its yield, but it was non-nuclear. This is how big of an explosion it was. In Russia, north of Moscow, I think it was about 230 miles or so uh, north of Moscow, where we blew, when I say we, we I, the West, which anytime you talk about NATO or the West, it's only the United States of America, right? Period. Uh, so we, the United States of America, um, sent in a weapon that nobody's even sure what it is yet because nobody's seen anything like it that hit the largest weapons depot in all of russia think how big the russian territory is and what they did in one foul swoop was they eliminated any chance of russia continuing to fight with conventional weapons so that comes on the heels of over 3100 main battle tanks being destroyed of about 6000 main battle tanks so we've depleted 50 percent of their main battle tanks not to mention all the thousands and tens of thousands of other uh ife infantry fighting vehicles apcs armored personnel carriers and other pieces of equipment the the West, the United States has strategically, intentionally obliterated any ounce of conventional warfare fighting capability for Russia strategically on uh, strategically for a particular end state. The end state is this. They cannot get Russia to act with nuclear weapons and across red lines to justify our preemptive strike of nuclear weapons. So Russia has shown so much tactical restraint, strategic restraint for so long that the West is freaking out because all of our economies are in free fall collapse. There's populist uprisings everywhere, all across the face of the earth and the West in particular, and they must have plausible deniability for what comes next, right? The the globalist elite Luciferian re re reset thing. And Russia will not take the bait no matter what. So because of that, we've done the last possible thing we can do, which is eliminate all their options. So the only thing that Russia is left with is a nuclear option. It was very strategic. So if you notice the same thing is happening elsewhere, it's happening with what's going on in the Middle East. We were talking off air about Israel uh, having the, the most likely near scenario of being reduced to a Samson option with the drawing out of all these different Arab and Islamic and their uh, all their affiliate nations coming against them with the Ezekiel 38-39 war to where they're strategically positioning the whole face of the earth that there is nothing left but a limited nuclear exchange because that achieves their their tactical strategic end game so this is what's going on in real time and I, and i'll just share this right now because it, it's probably the right place to interject it is uh 
I uh, had the off chain. I mean, it was literally completely random. Uh, I won't give any details. I was speaking somewhere out of out of state where I live. Uh, it was two weeks ago from today. And I had the opportunity to meet with the highest ranking guy that I've ever come into contact with. Uh, we'll say just uh, Stratcom times 10. How about that? I don't know how else to say it tactfully without implicating anything. Um, and as I was talking with this person in real time, uh, I was informed that he just got paged to Washington, D.C. for a 2 a.m. flight for an emergency meeting with a uh, what would be our strategic nuclear forces. This was two weeks ago. OK, so so as I'm talking to him, he goes, oh, my goodness, uh, I can't I won't even give any details about how high level this guy is. And I'm not saying that to be all cryptic and, you know, sensational. I'm just saying it because, you know, he, he trusted having this conversation with me. And um, anyways, uh, so that was two weeks ago. And now look what's what transpired within the last two weeks. Um, after having this individual having to go to a 2 a.m. flight for an early morning meeting in D.C., uh, beyond Stratcom type level stuff to discuss uh, options. And so since that time period, we've had the strike on Moscow. We had the strike in Beirut, Lebanon, or not Beirut, but in southern Lebanon just uh, last night. Uh, people speculating that it was a tactical nuke. I don't agree with that at all. Uh, I don't think people understand the yields that our conventional weapons can do now. And then on the heels of that, we also, uh, Israel got greenlit to do their widespread highest level cyber kinetic, cybernetic kinetic attack in human history in Lebanon against Hezbollah with the pagers and the radios and other electronic devices with the uh, what they're calling it is um, it's a uh, lithium thermal runaway is what they have the capacity to do is basically any electronic device and any single person's personal care. They have the capability of sending the, the right data to the hardware in that phone to cause the batteries, any lithium ion based batteries to go into what's called a thermal runaway and basically detonate and cause maiming type injuries, which Anybody who's operated on a modern battlefield knows that you do not want KIAs, you want WIAs. You want you want to create wounds, not kill wounds. Every time you wound somebody, you take five people out of the fight. You get a five-fold ratio when you wound somebody to killing somebody. So that's exactly what this uh, lithium-ion thermal runaway type of cybernetic warfare is capable of inflicting. And all of this is overlaying in real time at the exact same time with all the celestial alignments that I'm sure Brother Benjamin will get into at the exact same time of God's prophetic timeline coming into perfect convergent zenith in real time. Incredible. Wow, that was a lot. Brother, uh, before you, back to Benjamin here, but real quick, um, that uh folks what jamie's trying to share is you don't understand the ability that these electronics which sound so great the bad spots that we've all been put into and this conditioning now that you saw what they blew up over there with the pagers and everything else but the conditioning that we have been and maybe we'll share some of this later with uh with our watches and smart technology are quickly leading us to a place of of that we you know the Bible speaks of uh, stuff that deals with the mark of beast and other things and folks it, it's dangerous stuff so uh, it's not a bad time to begin to start to pry yourself away from the need to be in constant communication and if you do need to talk with some people you know and you want to talk in this time and area use apps like signal or something like that you can stay encrypted and, and stay off the main radar and, and protect your speech as much as humanly possible but begin weaning yourself away from this need to always have your electronics devices and i'll tell you what your life will change um and so brother benjamin back to you because some of the stars as jamie was saying as you were mentioned earlier are besides that and then of course the moon i didn't even know anything about the second moon but brother i'll let you take it from here yeah well yeah i didn't know we had a second moon either i've been busy for the last couple of days and i missed that data point oh it's incredible the signs and the stars which you know were hidden from the church for who knows centuries i guess 
the wise men in the Bible could read the stars and they figured out it was time for Jesus to be born. And they, you know, they searched out through the scriptures, he'd be in Bethlehem. And so, you know, we call those the three wise men. But today, there's not too many people who've got the wisdom to even invest any time in studying the signs. And we're not talking astrology. You know, the church got scared away from looking at the signs that God put in the heavens because Satan created a counterfeit. Well, you know, he's got a counterfeit for everything that's true. And, you know, that doesn't mean we should reject the truth. Just don't touch the counterfeit. The biblical message in the stars is a message to God's people. It's a message to the earth. It's, it's not an individual horoscope. You know, these signs in the stars aren't individual prophecies. They, they talk about the timing of what God is doing, period. And, and brothers and sisters, I'll tell you, the, the judgment is in the heavens. You know, the next eclipse is on October 2nd, Rosh Hashanah. The first eclipse this year was on April 8th, the eve of Nisan 1, the spiritual new year. You know, this is the 70th Jubilee. The midpoint of the year of the Jubilee year is October 9th. The second half of the Jubilee is the day of vengeance. Everything is everything's ready. The nations are ready. The, R Russia, the, they've announced that they are at full combat readiness as to their nuclear missile forces. They've been practicing launches. You know, they've been going through the whole pre-launch check system on a daily basis, going all the way to the point of turning the key and putting pushing the button. And, you know, they're getting ready because they're actually going to launch these missiles. You know, and the war comes in the middle of the night for Babylon, America. It's going to start at 9 a.m. in Moscow, or approximately. It'll be 2 a.m. in New York, 11 p.m. on the West Coast. It'll be night, a night of darkness in Babylon. And, you know, Russian military doctrine is very different than the American doctrine. And I don't understand why we even keep our doctrine of limited escalation. I mean, to me, it's, you know, it never made any sense at all. The idea that, well, you know, there'll be a limited use of tactical nuclear weapons on the battlefield. And, you know, maybe the Russians will fire first, you know, and then we'll, we'll drop a few tactical nukes and, you know, then saner minds will prevail and, you know, we'll walk back from the escalation and we'll end up in peace talks. Well, that's nice. You know, I mean, that's, it's a nice bedtime story. You know, that's maybe how the Girl Scouts would fight a war. It's not how the Russian military thinks at all. Their official strategy is the axe theory. And it, it embraces the concept of, look, if you're going to engage in a war with a nuclear power, such as the United States, you launch a massive decapitating strike. You don't want to take a counterpunch. It's kind of like a bar fight. Do you really want to sit there and trade punches with the guy? You might go home without a tooth. It's better to just one TKO blow, put him out, put him on the floor. And that's what the Russian strategy, they call it the axe theory. And it encompasses a massive decapitating nuclear strike. It starts with a blackout of our NORAD satellites. You know, and, and Russia's got military satellites with small little EMP weapons, little, little EMP weapons on small little missiles. And they, in outer space, there's no diffusion. There's no atmosphere. You know, you just got to get line of sight and you, know, you fry the electronics of everything within sight. And they go dark. NORAD will go dark. And while they're scrambling around, submarine launch cruise missiles, which Henry Groover saw in a number of visions. Dmitry Dudeman talked about it as well from the oceans. And right now we've got Russian nuclear submarines off the Atlantic and West Coast seaboard and down in the gulf of mexico they're yeah just... they're everywhere and you, you know what brother brother benjamin is that that the other thing that most people are unaware of is the uh, drone submarine capabilities of russia and how many are sitting on top of our undersea cables now most people don't understand that they think all telecom 
and transactions are are satellite based space based they're not they're still all terrestrial based in fact 98% of all telecom and all financial transactions run on undersea cables that go from our eastern seaboard to uh Ireland and Great Britain and then to mainland Europe and to the rest of the world 98% of all communications and all financial transactions and Russia regularly sends pictures of their underwater submarine drones sitting on top of the hundreds of cables that are down there on the seafloor just letting everybody know at any second we're going to cut you off We'll cut off. We will make you blind, deaf, and dumb in an instant, and there's nothing you can do about it. And that's why the the recent um, revelations of the UK Navy having to escort Russian submarines uh, through the English Channel are significant because what they did is they caught them sitting on top of the cables off the coast of Ireland and uh, started escorting them out of the way. So like you're saying, like this thing is – it's just – ready it is the single day single hour days of noah days a lot everything's business as usual everything looks totally normal and then it isn't that's exactly what's coming down the pipeline and most people don't have the paradigm even those who are in their word don't have the paradigm to understand what this looks like when when the lord actually removes his hand and allows them to carry out what they've been scheming to carry out for for eons now yeah yeah it's, well the american people can't even believe it you know, they think it's impossible. Yeah, go ahead, Frank. No, it's a, and Benjamin, you'd probably know this better than me, but from what I have understood always that that the only reason they know because they stumbled upon them. I've heard that it finding a Russian sub is like trying to find a needle in a, in a thousand haystacks. It's impossible. I mean, it's so hard to find one. They can pretty much roam around completely undetected. And so if one is found, it's because they were stumbled upon. I mean, that's yeah, what I've or, heard. Or they wanted to be seen as a as a big right. metal finger, as a threat, you know? yes. <laughs> yeah. But from what I – and that's the thing people don't understand is, folks, they're not just – you know, they're not just sitting there, you know, off their shores waiting to head our way. They're sitting they're, – they're right off our coast all the time. Well, yeah, and, absolutely. The thing about nuclear war is the guy that strikes first is basically going to win. And, and, you know, in our case, the American people think we have a deterrent. You know, we all grew up, those of us that, you know, have a few years under our belt, under the doctrine of mutually assured destruction, the mad theory. It worked great in the 60s. Maybe it worked in the 70s. But in 1963, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, President Kennedy had the B-52s in the sky over the Arctic Circle, just outside of Russian airspace, fully loaded with atomic bombs, and all that was needed was the radio signal, go. Today, the air wings are not even alerted. Unless that's changed, and maybe you, you know more than I do, Jamie, but my understanding is that Biden did not want to alert the air wings. He didn't want to raise the DEFCON status because he didn't want to you create the impression that we were escalating. So you've got your entire strategic air command on the ground. The flight crews are probably off base. The planes aren't fueled. The weapons are in underground storage bunk bunkers. Dr. Peter Vincent Pry, who probably one of the top experts in nuclear war, permanent member of a number of defense intelligence committees on the Hill, he told me it would take a minimum of 24 to 72 hours to get those planes in the air. They'll be gone in 30 minutes. And then you got yeah. our try. Yeah, you, they're gone. Then you got the Trident yep. fleet, right? What do we got? Four boomers at sea at any one time three to four boomers at sea, they do not have the launch codes. Why not? If you were serious about defending the U.S. today, I'd have the B-52s in the air, locked and loaded. I'd have the launch codes on the tridents. And I'd tell the subcommanders, when you put up your radio buoy, if we don't answer, launch everything. And yeah, then tell it's, it's even more scary than that. Like, so, um, you know, as far as our, our nuclear triad, especially with the terrestrial based stuff, like our, our, you know, uh, missile systems, terrestrial based missile systems is, um, most people again, cause they, they compartmentalize the data or we're not able to 
to look at the macro. But if we remember under the Obama administration and it rolled in even into the Biden administration as well, too, is the amount of firings at uh, Offit and Maelstrom and a couple of the other bases of our strategic terrestrial base nuclear missile uh, leadership has all been purged. Why? Because they weren't from this is what I've what I've gleaned from open source intelligence, because they weren't going to accept the stand down orders that they were going to be given. There's been 20 some general staff and command staff of our terrestrial based missile systems that have been removed from their positions in a very short order of time. And the other thing about deterrence is that we have no capability to absorb a first strike from Russia. Most listeners aren't aware that we only have 44 interceptor missiles, 44. Russia, I believe, has uh, pushing, I don't know, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to misspeak, but I, I want to say it, they're uh, pushing 2000 nuclear weapons. Uh, we, they have more than us. We're at like 1800 nuclear, nuclear weapons. We used to have 70,000. Now we're down to 1800 because of all the different treaties that have gone on over the last 30, 40 years. But, um, we have 44 interceptor missiles, 40 of which are in Alaska. The other four, I believe are like in, in, uh, Montana or Wyoming or something like that. We only have 44, just so you know, one missile from a Russian boomer, one missile, these MERS, these multiple re-entry, you know, uh, uh, warheads, one missile would take out all, would absorb all of our deterrence, all of our interceptor missiles. And by the way, of those 44 missiles, they say they have about a 30% accuracy rate. 44 interceptor missiles, 30% accuracy rate against right. Over 2,000 nuclear warheads that Russia has. It's it's a done deal. So this gets into the Chinese spy balloons going overhead, the cybernetics, what they were doing. The guys I talked to in the intel signals intelligence community said that those Chinese balloons were the stand down orders were given by the executive branch because the Chinese balloons were actually pulling signals data to impede the uh, communications from the nuclear football to the terrestrial based arm of the of our nuclear triad to delay any type of retaliatory attack and that our government is so compromised that that's why the stand down orders were given to not shoot down the balloons till they got the signals data that they needed to impede the launch codes from the executive branch to the to the terrestrial base leg of our nuclear triad that was the whole reason for it. So nothing is going to, this is goes into the destruction of mystery Babylon single day, single hour. Like you said, Henry Gruber's vision, Dimitri Dudeman's vision, how they, he saw the radio antenna and the signal stopped and the nuclear war was happening and nobody even knew it was happening. It's a done deal. It's a done deal. This isn't like future tense. This isn't like a possibility or potential, you know, a potential type of uh, a strategy that's going to be rolled out. It's all done. I, I'll just say this, that I talked to another guy. If I mention his name, everybody doesn't know his name. Actively still works at the Pentagon. He's kind of a household name as far as that, that high level of leadership, especially in the 70s and 80s. He told me unequivocally, he said, every single one of the Joint Chiefs is bought and paid for by China. And every single one of them is going to give stand down orders when the time comes. Well, that makes sense because if you look at the, I can't remember what the name of the senator, I believe it was, that did a radio interview not too long ago and on this Alabama local program, flat out said, we have no idea. We've seen their faces, but we have no idea who the people are that are running our country. They don't even yeah. know. They said they have, we've seen their faces. We don't know their names. Mm -hmm. we, we know it's not the president of the United States. He just he just freaked out and didn't even know where he was and called for who's next. Uh, over there <laughs> yeah. with the, I mean, what a, you know, we know he's not running it. Folks, there are P I do not doubt anything you just said, Jamie, because we are so beyond compromise that even our own elected officials don't know who's running our country. Yeah. Yeah. And then and then that gets into this convergent thing, you know, that we're that we're collectively talking about this, this convergence. And on the Russian thing, I, I think it's important for the listeners. So I'll just do a, a quick, quick thing on that is to know and understand that Russia 
you know, um, Brother Benjamin was talking about that they have a very different doctrine that us as Westerners, we we don't understand the Slavic and Russian mentality. But to add to that, what most people don't understand is that Russia, the Russian brand of communism, Russian orthodoxy and communism is only Luciferianism. They need to know and understand that. And by the way, there's a reason why it's called the CCP, the you know Communist Chinese Party, because they are an offshoot of what was originally coming out of Russia and the Russian czars, and has been um, you know like this conflagration across the rest of the earth through socialist, communist, Leninist, Marxist ideas pushed out everywhere else around the face of the earth that it was it's actually rooted in theosophy from Madame Madame Blavatsky theosophy is only ever luciferianism and by the way theosophy in the theosophical society is at the root of the modern monetary theory and the modern concept of our govern our ruling class in the United States of America are all are all theosophist which is luciferianism at its core without it, they make no apologies about it who they worship what they worship where they're taking us so again people don't know and understand the spiritual connotation of what's going on they want to look at it as just straight geopolitics or straight militaristic analysis or straight whatever at this very kind of rudimentary level but if you don't break beyond that and have this uh, understanding of the spiritual connotation of what's going on and how it's all related. You mentioned Gog and Magog. Most people don't realize that the chief deity of the city of London, the city of London, which is actually the financial district of all the West, including uh, Manhattan and Wall Street, is all ruled and reigned from the city of London. The city of London is like the Vatican. It's its own sovereign territory within London called the city of London, like the Vatican is its own sovereign territory in Rome, the city of London and its chief deities are Gog and Magog, which they say were ancient, half human, half angelic beings who rule and reigned the British Isles. And in fact, to this day, Every year in the city of London, they have the Gog and Magog Festival where they have these effigies of these giant Nephilim freak shows that they usher down the city. And they say that that is the ruling power, the ruling principalities of the British Isles and therefore the West. So, again, if we don't if we don't understand the spiritual connotation of why there's such a convergent zenith, we're going to miss it. And we're going to think it's just nuanced, you know, tit for tat political gamesmanship. That's not it. This is the cosmic usurpation of God and his created order all the way to the bio biological level, genetic level, and everything in between. The destruction of Israel, the destruction of humanity, the destruction of the human genome, the destruction of the family, the destruction of your spirit, the destruction of your soul. And it's all converging right now in real time. Absolutely. Wow. You may remember the song London Calling. London Calling to the Underground. The Ice Age has come. You know, the, basically, the power of the satanic global government is in London because that's where the seat of the beast is. That's the lion that will be lifted up when the feet of the, the bear and the body of the leopard and the head of the lion come together after the eagle's wings are plucked and yeah, it says in Jeremiah 51, verse 30, the mighty men of Babylon have forborne to fight. They remained in their holds. Their power has failed. They became as women. Some of them even wear dresses now. It's bizarre. Yeah, literally. Yeah, literally. Yeah. Uh-huh. Truest statement who would ever. Have ever. Yeah, who would have ever thought it would be fulfilled literally that they would begin dressing like women? They burn their dwelling places. Their power has been broken. One post shall run to meet another, one messenger to another to report to the king of Babylon that his city has been taken. And the men of war are terrified. You know, this is an extermination that's about to happen, and only a remnant is going to be saved. And, you know, not by the force of arms, but by the power of Almighty God. But, you know, it's amazing how still all of this is happening, like real time. Russia is practicing nuclear war, telling the West, we are going to use these weapons against you if you continue to fire long-range missiles. But it's all a puppet show. These political leaders in the West that have disarmed us, that have stood us down, 
they intend for the American people to be sacrificed. Absolutely. It's a satanic murder. It's a satanic ritual, a black and dark night of burning. It's been planned for the American people. And there were 3,000 that died on the last day of World War I. Uh, it was literally the, the armistice was hours away. November 11, 11 a.m., the generals ordered their men over the trenches at 9 o'clock in the morning. For what? For a ritual sacrifice, a blood sacrifice to start a massive 110 years satanic ritual that would culminate in World War III. And yep. 9-11 yeah. was part of that ritual. And again, nearly 3,000 died on September 11th when the towers fell. And now this is the ritual to initiate the servants of the beast into the new age of the Antichrist. Satan has demanded a thousand times as many sacrifice victims. 300 million is the objective. You know, if you think about it, they're packing all these migrants who are being brought here basically on buses all the way from Panama, paid for by either the U.S. or the U.N. I mean, they packed this country with 30 million migrant refugees, which are the, the Trojan horse covering the two to three million troops that have come in. They're packing them into the cities that are going to burn because they want 300 million dead from the nuclear strike on the United States. You know, what's crazy about that is they don't even hide it. You know, most most of the listeners are probably familiar with the Deagle report and, and other different things like that that have come out from the intelligence think tanks. And they they just say it. They, I mean, it's like they just say it. We want 200, 225 million. That's their number from the Deagle report in 2025 that the U.S. the U.S. population will be reduced by 225 million. And yeah. and will basically cease to be a non-entity. And you're right; it is it is all a ritualistic, long-term strategic objective for satanic ritualistic abuse over the face of the earth. You know, and and that World War One, you get the League of Nations. World War Two, you get the United Nations. World War Three, you finally get the beast system. That's been the play all along. But you have to you have to foment or terraform. That and create a global psychosis of fear because of the bloodshed in order to terraform the earth to bring about what they want to bring about. And it and it is right on the verge. And that's why people go, you know, they, they, they can think that this kind of information is hyperbolic or sensational. And it's like, it's not. It's just, it's plain as day to them. It's very clear. It's very simple. Uh, and, and, it, and it's a goal that they have been aiming for for a long time. And what they get, the outcome of the aftermath is the consolidation of governments. They get the uh, reductionism of borders. They get the, the 10 kingdoms and the kings to rule over the face of the earth. They get a digital back currency. They have a new counterfeit uh, omniscience and omnipresence through both Starlink and the Chinese equivalent of Starlink that's putting another 50,000 satellites in space in the next two years. And then you get your uh, implantable, you know, um, RFID, which is beyond RFID, nanotech, tech chips, which uh, somebody, you know, recently uh, clued me into what's going on with that through a company called uh, Equi Equilibrio. I can't say it. Uh, Equilibrio. And actually, the, the recent sinking of a yacht, a super yacht, $40 million yacht off the coast of Italy is linked to what is actually the nanotech for the mark of the beast. I'm two guys removed from a guy that spoke very plainly about what was going on with that sinking of that yacht off the coast of Italy and the technology that the, the people on that yacht that were killed were working on and the company's landing page, which I challenge everybody to go look at. The more people that know it, uh, the, the more will be informed, which is uh, equal brio. Am I saying that right, brother Frank? I keep butchering that, but uh, I think I'm saying it right. Equal brio, but it's a self implantable nanotech technology for full-time monitoring it is the first in its class of uh what's like an analyst type or analyze based nanotech not rfid totally different and uh they said that within two and a half years they need to mass produce this through equilibrio so that every person on the face of the earth and then some can have one implanted subdermally so, yeah. I mean, it's literally converging in real time. Yeah, the site's E-Q-U-I-L-B-R dot I-O. Yep. 
And they I made it so Eric, nice, self self preventable, so they can just you all can do it. Everybody can do it themselves, and, and it'll be self ruination. So yep, so self immolation, right? Yeah, <laughs> that's so. exactly what it'll be. Um, yeah, that's that's some that's some insane stuff, folks. And and like we were talking about earlier, you people people have already been conditioned for this stuff. The health mark has always been the way to infiltrate through the um through the medical field i mean look at the symbols on the med- i mean they've been telling us for how long i don't know symbol through the through the whole medical field you know with the snakes and everything i mean it's been there forever yeah so, yeah. Um, yeah and it's it's that that basis of pharmacy and it, it is interesting that when you look again one of the nuances of mystery babylon is that she deceives the whole world with her pharmacia Right. And and from her or in her, as it renders, is found the slain of all the earth. All of the earth is from one singular entity, Mystery Babylon. So it's very, very particular. So then when you look at the nuances of, uh, you know, Johnson and Johnson and blah, blah, blah. I don't know all the other different companies, Pfizer and all these companies. And then and then all the nanotech, which which the nanotech in the Silicon Valley is directly linked to Israel. I mean, Israel is the tech capital of the earth is Israel, you know, and but but only because of the protectorate of because of being a protectorate of Mystery Babylon, the United States of America. So it is all interconnected. Um, Brother Benjamin, I'm always fascinated about um, the things that you've been sharing with me off air about um, Yom Kippur in October 10, 11, and 12 in particular, is that, can you, can you dig into that? Because I'm learning from you in real time as you talk about it. Well, it's not very far off now, is it? <laughs> We're not at all. Talking about, well, let's see, uh, what, 19 days, something like that, three weeks, it's less a few days. Well, you know, that's a, that's a popular day for a war, isn't it? It's the day when Israel is going to be the most vulnerable majority of the religious Jews turn off the phone and the radio. They were attacked in 1973 on Yom Kippur, and and they almost lost because of an inability to mobilize. And so, but I, this year, I think they're, um, I think they'll be ready. They're not going to be surprised on this Yom Kippur. So we'll see, you know, the, this war is going to accelerate quickly. And, you know, we're, we're kind of in the very first phase. I mean, World War III began with a biological weapons release in 2019. And of course, they sold it to us as a, you know, a bowl of bat soup was responsible. And they were adamant, you know, that lie was the truth. And then it turned into, well, that it was really an accident. Right. Yeah, you just accidentally released a bioweapon on the 666-year anniversary of the Black Plague in exact perfect time to crush the Hong Kong dissident movement. And there was a huge protest movement in Wuhan as well. And we all saw the videos of Chinese authorities taking people out of their apartments. And those people were fighting to resist being arrested. They weren't sick. They were the dissidents who were now easily rounded up during the lockdown. And, you know, and then the war started in Ukraine in 22, and then it exploded in the Middle East in 23, and now it's going to blow sky high World War III in 24. You know, the 70th Jubilee, if you guys, if you've read the book, The Day of the Lord Has Come, you know, I go into detail, but, you know, the prophecy of Daniel 9, verse 24, 77s have been appointed for the people of Israel. Those are Sabbath years. Seven Sabbath years is the compass of a Jubilee. 70 Jubilees from the Exodus to the coming of the Lord as the lion from the tribe of Judah in his people before he comes in the clouds as the king of kings. And, you know, if you just do the math, the Exodus was in around 1450. We're on the verge of the final Jubilee. And I don't have time to go through all the math, but it turns out the final Jubilee is a spiritual Jubilee. It's the year in which God's going to redeem and perfect a remnant of his people who are going to come into a complete and total redemption. And then the Laodicean church is going to be redeemed through the fire. And they'll be purified as well. And they'll get a crown of glory for having been faithful to the Lord unto death. 
And the wicked, well, they're being delivered unto judgment. And woe unto them. But you know, there, there are many people today who call themselves Christians who are the, the many that Jesus spoke of when he said, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord. And I'll say, I never knew you. Many shall seek to enter through a wide road. And they're going to say, we were bishops. We were prophets. We were watchmen. You know, we sold camping gear in your name. We came to merchandise the gospel. We came to glorify our own name. We, we came with a whole different agenda, but we were not sent by the Lord because the majority of these people don't even know the Lord. And isn't that amazing that there are people today, and this is the majority. This is not some little fringe group. The Lord said many on that day, the vast majority. The word is polis in the Greek, and it means the vast majority. It's not 51%, my friends. It's more like 97% are going to find out they were never born again. And they face the eternal judgment. You know, they got websites. They're teaching about the last days and they themselves are headed to hell. Only a remnant is being saved. Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant shall be saved. And in the book of 2 Ezra, the scripture or the text writes, the number being saved can be compared to a drop of water versus a wave in the ocean. So, you know, for the first and foremost things, my friends, is be sure you're born again. If any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if, you know, if you're a Christian who's got the gnosis, the head knowledge, you're part of the Hellenist movement, where in your head you figured out Jesus is Lord, well, okay, good job. Yeah, you, you got that part right. But have you repented from your heart? You know, Jesus said, all of my disciples will fast and pray after I'm taken from them. Fasting and prayer is not some idea that Frank or I came up with. It's a commandment in the scriptures. Read the book of Joel. The Lord commands it of his people. If you're a disciple, then you're fasting and praying. If you're not fasting and praying, you are not a disciple. You are a spectator. And there's a significant probability you're not even born again. Well, guess what, folks? There's still time to be saved. But I would suggest, you know, we look, the human heart is deceitfully wicked. We don't want to see our own sin. It's too ugly. So what do we do with it? We bury it. We disassociate from it. We deny it. And then we see it in our neighbor. And oh, does that ever make us angry? Because unconsciously, it reminds us of our own stuff. You know, look, it's great to be in the remnant. You know, the remnant are going to see the second half of the ministry of Jesus. The Lord has a seven-year ministry in the earth. He did the first half himself when he came as a man. Now he's coming as God in his people, in an anointing without measure. And his ministry will be that of the Lion of Judah, not the Lamb of God. He's coming to make war on his enemies. He's coming to deliver a righteous remnant. And he's going to purify a backslidden and compromised church. Well, folks, the purification process is the death camps of the Antichrist. I would caution you. I would admonish you, don't go that way. You don't have to go that way. You can seek the Lord through the comfort of your own home while there's still time through fasting and prayer and ask the Lord to search your heart because trust me in this, you really would prefer not to go to the camps. I know, I've been there. I got translated there and changed my life. And, you know, I experienced the death camps. And, you know, I, I couldn't even talk about it without weeping for a solid week. I mean, I would break down weeping. You know, if I even thought about what I experienced, you know, it was when the Lord put me back in my living room, I'm screaming hysterically, Lord, what must we do to be saved from this judgment that's coming? And Jesus answered me audibly, you know, don't despise prophetic utterance, but rather test all things and see if it be confirmed by the word of God and by the spirit of God. This is what I testify Jesus said. When I asked him, Lord, what must we do to avoid this, in, this horrible persecution that's going to come? And he said, I will protect that which is mine. And everything else will be destroyed. And I'm telling you, he hit, I, I felt like he slammed his 
fist on his desk. And he said that destroyed word so loud, I cannot yell as loud as God. It shook my house. He's not kidding. Everything else faces destruction. And so, you know, look, it's great to prepare in the natural. It's great to know what time it is. It's like half past midnight, folks, you know, but the most important thing, you got to get ready. And look, if you are born again, but you still got sin areas in your life that are still dominating you, and you know what I'm talking about, gluttony, pornography, pride, unforgiveness, right? Just basic rebellion. You know, if you're still in love with Babylon, if any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. If, if that's you in, in, in any degree, ask God to search out your heart. Begin fasting and praying. Gather with a few people you love and trust and have your own little solemn assembly. And yeah, two people can do a solemn assembly all by themselves. And you know what? Get honest. Go get the book out of the darkness. Read that book. It will blow the darkness right out of your life. And, you know, do business with the Lord on the reality. You know, stop pretending. The church was taught to pretend. You know, name it and claim it, you know. You know, people run around, I'm claiming Psalm 91, brother. You cannot claim Psalm 91. Those who dwell in the secret hiding place of the Lord. You know, let me read the psalm to you. You know, Psalm 91, he that dwells in the secret place of the Most High God will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. He is my refuge and my fortress. Surely he will deliver you from the snare of the follower and from the, from the pestilence, from the bioweapons. He'll cover you. He'll hide you. He's your shield, your buckler. You will not be afraid of what is coming. The, neither the arrow that flies by day or the, the terror and the bioweapons by night, the pestilence that's in the darkness, the, nor the destruction that's going to waste these cities at noonday. A thousand will fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand. It will not touch you. But you cannot claim this promise. This is for people who dwell. Not only do they enter the secret place of the Lord, which is the holy place, you know, they, they go from the outer court to the inner court, which is the holy place where only those that are anointed are permitted to enter in. And not only do they enter in, but they dwell there. They stay in the anointing. They're walking in the peace and the shalom of the Lord throughout the day. You know, if you're just visiting in the outer court when you listen to these programs, and then you're back to basically outside the temple, you're back in Babylon, living your life, watching, you know, the entertainment, listening to satanic music, watching the satanic programming, you know, you're out there in the world. Friends, you're not in the secret hiding place, and you can't claim it. you got to actually live there. This is a reality. You can't pretend you dwell in the inner court with the Lord. You either are there or you are not. And if you're not there, you're not in the remnant. Okay, well, you know, that's a big deal. Because not only do you go to the death camps, but you take your children with you. You take your wife with you. You take your husband with you. You know, and when I went on national tour back in 98, when when my first book, The Day of the Lord is at Hand, came out, I would ask the audience, are there any mothers in here? Raise your hand. Do I have any grandmothers or any mothers? Are there any mothers that still love their children? Enough to fast and pray. Any grandmothers love their grandbabies? Enough to fast and pray. Turn off Babylon. Get into the Word. Sanctify your time. Sanctify your lives. And then I'd ask the fathers, how, how many men in here are fathers or grandfathers? Do any of the men in the church love their wives and their children or their grandchildren enough to fast and pray? Look, maybe you can't put that cheeseburger down, you know, and you, you can't put away that chocolate milkshake from Jack in the Box for your own sake. What about your children? If you take them to the death camps, you're not going to be happy because they're going to take your kids from you. They're going to take your wife from you. I don't need to tell you what they're going to do to your wife. What they're going to do to your kids. They're going to try to indoctrinate your kids. They're going to tell your kids, mommy and daddy, we're sick. 
mommy and daddy are, are being, you know, they're being helped. They're being treated. They're, you know, the government's helping your mommy and daddy. And, you know, you need to understand the truth, you know. And they're going to try to recycle your kids back into the beast system. See if they can get your children to deny Christ. And if your kids have got the Lord with them, they won't. And then your children will be martyrs right along with you. You know, you don't have to go that way. There's a better way. But you got to seek the Lord with all your, all your heart. With all your strength. You got to redeem the time, you know, and yeah, it's great to prepare in the natural. I mean, you know, sure. Get some food provisions and have some backup power and, you know, all that stuff. Yeah, that's really good. But look, if we're not in the right place spiritually, we have wasted our time. Hey, man, I know yeah. <clears throat> one of the things I get asked the most is, uh, you know, just because of my my professional background, which I consider all as lost compared to knowing Christ and being unified with him. But, you know, people are like, what, what should we be doing? What should we be doing? You know, and they, they want, they want the punchy sound biting, rah, rah, cool guy, prepper stuff. Right. And, uh, and, and I say the same thing every single time, dwell, hide and abide. That's it. That's your, that's your only matrix for actual practical tactical preparedness is to dwell hide and abide dwell hide and abide and like you're saying brother benjamin is that it's not something that you can claim it's something that you do you know like uh like the apostle says is you know you say you have faith uh yeah whatever that means very little to me faith without deeds is dead i will show you my faith by my deeds and the faith in the deeds that the lord are looking for is those who dwell hide and abide and i think of all the time of joshua and exodus 33 people always wonder like wow man i, I wish i had the spirit of joshua and the spirit of caleb you know two out of the 2.5 to 4 million guys the only two that really knew their god yeah i want to be a warrior like joshua and caleb i'm like but you don't understand the groundwork that was laid when God said, go take the land, it's filled with Nephilimic freak show. Don't worry. I'm with you. I'll be with you. Do not fear. I've delivered its kings and all of its mighty men to you. Go take it. Why Joshua was so easily able to say, aye, aye, sir. You have to back up to Exodus 33. Very obscure scripture where it says Mo Moses used to meet with the Lord as a man meets with his friend. And after that, he would go and minister to the to the Israelites in the camp. And it says, but Joshua, his young aide, refused to leave the tent of meeting. He would not leave the presence of the living God. He dwelled in the tent of meeting. You know that everybody had free access to the tent of meeting? It's whoever wanted to could go to the tent of meeting and literally sit in the presence of the Lord. And it says Moses would go to the tent of meeting every day and all the Israelites would arise and they would fall down in fear as Moses would walk by and go to the tent of meeting. They had free access to it too. Whoever wanted to could go dwell and abide in the presence of the most high God, whoever, but they just chose not to. They, they saw Moses doing it. They saw Joshua doing it, but they refused to do it themselves. They wanted to ride on the shirt tails of those guys' intimacy with the living God, which is what the Evangelical Christian church does these days. But what it says about Joshua is that he refused to stop dwelling in the presence of the Lord. That's why at the appointed time, when God said, go take the land, no matter what it looks like in front of you, no matter what the circumstances are informing you of, no matter how dire it looks, no matter how inferior and adequate you are in the natural, you, he said, aye, aye, sir, because he knew his God. And mm -hmm. that goes right into the fulfillment of Daniel eleven thirty two that those who know their God will be strong and go forth and do exploits, or as it renders, go forth and do daring feats of valor, those who have a knowing of their God. And the only way to have a knowing of your God is if you dwell and abide and you hide in the shelter of your God. You know him and he knows you. And notice what it says in Matthew 7. They said, Lord, Lord, he says, away from me. I don't know you. I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. And that distinction of this remnant-based intimacy with the Lord is all centered on a knowing. And the only way to grow in a knowing is to have that perpetual, incessant longing of your heart to dwell in his presence. I always think about this too, with regards to even like the, the Levites, right? Which we're called a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a chosen people, people all of his own. 
right? That we, he has foreknown us to be a kingdom of priests. So we are this priesthood. And what's interesting about the priesthood is that all the other tribes got their allotment. They got their little portion and their portion was carnal. It was worldly. It was temporal. They got land. But when it came to the Levites, he said, you will not get a portion, an inheritance of land like all your other brothers and all the other tribes, but your portion will be my literal presence. And that was more than sufficient. And that should be the only desire of our heart is the literal presence of the living God, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit with the word of God, so saturating our mind and our hearts and our souls, so filled to overflowing, our cup can't help but pour out and spill out on everybody else around us because all we want is him. And that is the distinction, the distinction that God makes in Malachi 3, 16 through 4, 3, that he distinguishes those who serve him from those who do not, just as a father distinguishes a son who serves him from a son who does not, is based on those whose only ever waking desire is for the presence of living God. It says, then those who feared the Lord, those who feared the Lord, not liked the Lord and not who appreciated the Lord and not who are really super duper happy to have fire insurance, but those who feared the Lord were found talking with one another about him. And the Lord heard and the Lord listened and a scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared him and revered him. He said, those are the ones who will make up my treasured possession and I'm going to distinguish them because they want to dwell, hide and abide in my presence. And I'm good and I'm just and I will satisfy the desires of the heart. And those who do not want me, they love the world and the things of the world. I will satisfy their heart's desires too. They are ne will never be content with my presence. Then I'll satisfy their desires and keep them from my presence for all of eternity. This is the holy God that we serve. And this is what he's inviting us into openly, all equally, if we would just choose it. And this is the hardcore sifting and dividing and separating and the passing under the rod of God that is happening right now in real time. And we all get to make a choice. We all get to make a choice. And, and that doesn't mean that you're, that you have this sinless perfectionism, weird movement thing that's going on. It means that, you know, the sufficiency of Christ, not the sufficiency of you, you know, the righteousness of Christ, not the righteousness of you, you know, the holiness of Christ, not the holiness of you. It's the armor of God, not the armor of Jamie dragging out my kit from the Marine Corps out of my my closet to fight these things. I have the armor of God, which is literally Christ cover me, clothing me. The old is gone. The new has come. I'm clothed with Christ, with the mind of Christ in Christ. That is why I can have the confidence to stand before my holy God, blameless, spotless, pure, and without wrinkle, blameless on the day of the Lord. Not because I'm blameless, but because Christ in me is, and he has covered me and is more than enough. So this is like so critical for people to know and understand in Christ alone. It's the only way we're going to navigate this. It's the only way we're going to endure to the end and receive that crown of life. It's the only way that we're going to have the steadfastness and the perseverance and the bold, fearless resolve to make it all the way to the point, whatever our point is, whatever our end is, that we hear the most amazing thing ever, as it says in the book of Revelation, that he will profess our name before the father, before the heavenly host. You get to hear the God of all creation who spoke all the cosmos into existence. That's held together through super string theory, right? This harmonic resonance, that God who spoke that is going to speak your name out loud. That is your eternal reward. And oh, what a blessed day that's going to be. What a blessed day. Amen. Brother. Amen. Well, praise God, folks. Listen, but I want to just make something clear. What Benjamin's talking about, this is not beating yourself. This is not some kind of crazy cult. This is about what the Bible says when it means sanctification, about setting yourself apart unto the Lord. That's what we're asking right now. This is not remnant, some crazy remnant theology where we have some secret knowledge that nobody else knows. This is about Year, what Benjamin's doing this, been doing this for at least I, I, I've known him since 1999. He's always said the same thing. You need to hear from the Lord. This is about you and God coming on to the same wavelength, the, getting in tune with one another so that you can hear clearly in this last hour 
get out of the churches of Babylon, get out of the 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 ridiculousness of the modern day church and get right with God. It's not difficult, but it does mean you have to spend time alone with him. And uh, the reward is the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is something that makes no sense to anybody because it's the only thing that brings peace in the midst of total chaos. It's the only thing that actually gives us confidence when there's no confidence in this world left. That's what we're talking about, getting right with the Lord now while we have time. Don't take plan B. If you ever listened to Otto Koenig, he was a, he was a, uh, um, a missionary. I don't know, Brother Jamie or Benjamin, if you ever heard the pineapple stories um, of Otto Koenig's time with the headhunters in um, Papua New Guinea. But he always talked about going God's plan A, which Brother Benjamin was talking about. Don't do plan B, you know? Let's take the way the Lord has asked us, get alone, fasting and praying. It's not about proving or showing your works. It's about showing God that you are or, or, or letting God know that you cannot do this without him. That's all the word fasting and praying is about. It's about emptying yourself of the flesh to be filled with the spirit. Simple as that. And if you can't overcome something, if you can't get something, listen, God knows that. He can handle it. Let's just come clean. Let's bring it up. Let's pray and fast and seek his face and say, Lord, I can't do this without you. I'm going to need your help. But Lord, what I am going to do is I'm going to put my time and effort into seeking your face. It's as simple as that. The gospel is not complicated, folks, but the world and Babylon has confused it. It's complicated. it. It's distorted it. We have no special, this program has no crazy remnant belief that's different. We are saying, get in the word yourself, prove it out yourself, and seek the face of your heavenly father. I don't know what else we could say. God will take care of the rest. But you can't, don't wait till the day, don't, once the missiles fly, it's too late to start. Let's not wait till then. Let's start ahead of time because you know what? The Lord might say, hey, why don't you this day go somewhere else? Why don't you do this or that? We're not going to hear it if we're not in tune. And folks, I'm not above, when I pray to Lord, Lord, give me the grace to not only hear, but to then listen to what you say and not let my flesh override the spirit of the Lord speaking. It's very important in this hour. Brothers, thank you so much for the words shared tonight. It's important. I'll let you guys both give us a final word and share with the audience. This program has flown by like lightning. (laughs) Yeah, I I, I don't have a final word other than um, it's the same thing that that Christ has been speaking from the get-go, that the early church was speaking, that John the Baptist was speaking, is repent for the day the Lord is at hand. It's never changed. The message has never changed. Repent for the day of the Lord is at hand. And we have been assured biblically that there is a suddenly that is coming. A suddenly in an instant, in a single day, in a single hour, sudden destruction. There's no there's no slow slide into entropy. We're already there. And unfortunately, that's what people are looking for. They're waiting for they're waiting for the Hollywood version post-apocalyptic walking dead type of scenario to realize that it's the end of days. That's not at all biblical. It says days of Noah, days a lot. That means, and it gives you the qualifier. Everything is completely normal. And then it's not in an hour. It's all done. It's all over with, you know, and just today I was preaching on the the harvest, the great reaping that's coming. Last week I preached on the sifting, the great sifting that's coming. The Lord keeps giving me these very, very woeful words because it is time and the sickle is raised high and there is a true and better harvester who is going to begin harvesting and it just happens. So repent now willingly rather than later on desperately. Amen, brother. There's a separation at hand. And Dimitri Dudeman mentioned that there would be civil war and government would be fighting the people. The people would be fighting the government. I was talking to a brother today, Brother Brian out there in Oregon. And 
and the Lord spoke to him years ago and said that civil war was coming and that the nation would be divided and the civil war would manifest in three ways. At first, the nation would divide politically and we're there. You know, the, the, liber the liberal left, they hate the Christian foundation, the Christian heritage of the nation. And they hate us. We're divided politically. And we're also divided socially. You know, if, if you're not following the beast system, if you don't believe, you know, what they're telling you, you know, you're a thought criminal today. And, you know, we're being lied to by this corrupt government. And then lastly, there would be division racially. And, and the nation, you know, rather than eliminating racism, the polarization of the countries has, has brought racism to the forefront. And when the scripture said nations will rise against the nation, it literally means ethos and races. It's a, it's a division of race that's occurred. And so we're being divided on every front. The nation's at war with itself. The government's at war with the people. And that war is going to spill out into the streets in not too many days, folks. There was already a mass shooting today and by a group of people. And I don't know if they've had any leads, but... You know, we're being told the foreign troops that are here are going to begin engaging in, you know, final pink terror overture acts where there's literally going to be massive terrorism. Just like what happened in Israel on October 7th last year. Some intelligence sources say it's coming here on the anniversary on October 7th. What's that? Uh, two weeks from now? Something like that. So, you know, we're there. This is upon us. And, you know, the reason for fasting is, is as you make the decision to not feed your flesh, your flesh grows weaker. And, you know, go into your prayer closet and ask your father for living manna and for living water. Your spirit man will go stronger. And everybody can Amen. fast one day. And everybody is capable of fasting for one day. You know, if you've never fasted, then just do one day. You, we start out by, you know, eat a very healthy dinner, a lot of, you know, fiber, vegetables, you know, don't have like a big pizza. The dinner before you start your fast, have something that is going to be healthy and easily digested and finish eating by sundown or shortly after sundown. And then don't eat the next day and wait for breakfast on the following day. You just did 36 hours. What you did is you put your system into autophagy. It's totally healthy for you. You put your spirit into detox mode. And look, you're going to get hungry, okay? Your body's going to scream at you. And, you know, if you fast long-term after day three, if you're still hungry, that's just gluttony, friends. You know, just rebuke and cast that thing out of your life. And, you know, if your body's yelling at you, take authority over your own flesh. You've been given dominion over your body. I would tell my flesh, flesh, you died with Jesus on the cross. You were crucified with Christ. You are a dead man. I command you to shut up, and get back in the ground. I don't want to hear from you again. And your flesh will obey you. It'll shut up. And then go in your prayer closet and pray and say, Father, I'm fasting today in obedience to your word. I'm seeking your face. I'm doing what I can. And I'm not going to eat any food today in the flesh but I'm hungry in my spirit and I ask for living manna. I'm thirsty in my soul. I ask for living water. I guarantee you when you choose to set aside even one day to fast and pray and seek the Lord and you go into your prayer closet and you ask God for living manna, you ask your father in heaven to feed you because you're fasting in the natural. You're asking for the spiritual manna to come. He will not ignore your plea. You will mm. receive living manna. You will receive the living water. And those of you that, you know, your circumstances permit you to fast a little bit longer, you know, fast until the Lord tells you to stop. After day three, the hunger is gone. It's just gluttony. Once you cast that thing out, break that power off your life, you'll be amazed at what begins to happen. Day seven, your vision goes high definition. And the anointing comes like you've never seen. And yeah, there'll be the periodic you know, cravings for your favorite comfort food, right? Because we're Americans. We're all gluttons. 
I mean, it's most of us, the vast majority of us, this is a nation that eats. We're we're a, a, a nation of Christians. We only gather with potlucks. There's food in part of every American function. You know, it's always around eating and feeding the flesh. Well, the remnant needs to seek the Lord in the spirit. And believe me, brothers, reminds me of a dream I had and woke up on an airplane flight in this dream and the plane had taken off. I'd fallen asleep for the takeoff. I wake up, I look out the window, and we're flying like 15 feet above the ground uh, down a highway, and the streetlights are going by the wing. We're doing like 15 miles an hour, and I can see the traffic curving to the right, and all these traffic lights. And This plane is stuck in rush hour, flying above rush hour traffic, moving at 15 miles an hour. I turn to the guy seated next to me. I'm like, what is going on? Why are we flying so low and why are we flying so slow he turns to me he says well there's no food on this airplane and everybody on this plane wants to eat so the pilot's having to fly to the next airport here in this town so that we can get some airplane food and this is how how we can fly and this is how fast we can go if we want to eat i said can't we just forget the airplane food it's not even that good i want to fly at forty thousand feet and i want to do 600 miles an hour well, that's the difference between fasting and feeding the flesh. When you're feeding the flesh, you're making spiritual progress at about 15 miles an hour, and you're about 15 feet off the ground. Okay? When you're fasting, and you're fasting unto the Lord, not out of some religious, you know, system, but you're, for righteousness sake, you're seeking God's face. Friends, you can get up to 40,000 feet of altitude, and you can move forward spiritually at six. 100 miles an hour. And I'm telling you, in less than a day, you could be in Jerusalem. You can be in Zion in the spirit. And you know, the Lord responds. You know, if you've never fasted even one day, try just one day. And if you've, if you've got the opportunity, you know, use the distilled water with beets, celery, and, and carrots, organic, washed, cut up into little cubes. And the electrolytes bleed into the water and you can drink as much of it as you want. And it keeps your blood chemistry from crashing. And believe me, every one of us can fast and pray. And, you know, go read the book of Joel if you, you know, need further encouragement. But, you know, we were commanded to the generation of people that sees these things coming upon them. The Lord commanded the people to gather before the altar, to weep and to repent and to gather in times of fasting and prayer in solemn assemblies. Mm. Yom Kippur is a solemn assembly. It is a day of fasting. You know, the the Israelites, we not only fast from food, we fast from water that day. Sundown to sundown, there's no food, there's no water. We are on our faces before God. It's the great high holy day. It's also judgment day, by the way. Mm. And according to the commandment of the Lord, you show up on Yom Kippur, if you're not repentant, you may face the judgment of God in the next 12 months. Now, the Lord is so merciful. All of us showed up plenty of Yom Kippur's without repenting. And, and the Lord, you know, knew we we're just a bunch of dumb children. He forgave us anyway, and he gave us grace, and he gave us more time. But you know what? We're out of time. You know, and we're out of the age of grace. The time of the age of the Gentiles is about to be sealed up, friends. Mm -hmm. And we are there. You know, we're, we're not years away. Yeah. from Judgment Day. We're not even months away from Judgment Day. It is this fall. That is a mathematical certainty. You don't understand. Get the book. The day of the Lord has come. Or go listen to all the messages. But whatever you do, wake up already. This is not a game show. This is not some entertainment event. You are not going to watch the day of the Lord on your high-definition television. The Chinese troops are going to be coming and kicking down your front door. They're going to be bayoneting the American population. Unless you're an attractive woman, then they're going to be putting you in chains and throwing you in the back of their military trucks. And most of those women will wish they saw the bayonet. Mm. Mm. You know, this is serious. As serious as it's ever been. The scripture is very clear. This is the most wicked generation ever. This is the generation of his wrath. And we live among them. And what has been appointed for this generation is a judgment so severe, it has never been seen or witnessed before on the face of this earth. 
You can take Sodom and Gomorrah. You can take the Holocaust. You can take the siege and the starvation of Jerusalem. You can take the Black Plague. You can take all of the horrors of all the satanic kingdoms, the gulag in Russia, the concentration camps in Nazi Germany. You can roll them all into one, and you do not have anything close to what is about to happen. And you can't put down a cheeseburger for one day. You know, Mercy. I mean, think about this, my friend. Listen, if the Lord commands fasting and prayer and you refuse to obey, then the Lord will bring fasting upon you in a time that you will call famine. Mm -hmm. That's how it works, folks. So, you know, it's way better to look. Yeah. get Be a Plan little a. uncomfortable. Plan a. And obey the Lord. Yes. Amen. Amen. Folks, thank you, br brothers, both of you all. And and folks, please take this seriously as Brother Benjamin is talking about and Brother Jamie. Um, we we are we are sitting here just all we want is you to be right with God. That's the whole point of this program, the remnant call. We don't take money, I don't ask for money. I don't, you know what I mean? This program is simply dedicated to the Lord and and preparing the people to know their God, to meet their God. And and that's all. Nothing else. You've never, ever heard me ask one time ever in the history of this program for a dollar. You know why? Because I didn't start this program for money. I started for you, every one of you out there. And we do it because we care. And listen, the truth is, even if you have gluttony, by day four, that it, it will go. Your hunger will leave. I'm telling you, it will leave. One quick note, if you do want to fast longer, Never break it on the seventh day. Don't ever break a fast on the seventh day. Your body naturally purges on the seventh day. And you want to always you know, break after that. So just an FYI to anybody who wants to do a long-term fast. But brothers, thank you so much for this program tonight. Um, you know, this is not about fear. This is about taking action. The prudent man sees the evil that was coming and he hides himself, but the foolish are just, they're taken away. They're swept away. We are seeing the evil that's coming. We're taking action. We're hiding ourselves under the most high, under the wings of the most high. This is brother Frank, brother Benjamin and brother Jamie on the remnant call saying to everybody, good night and Shalom. <laughs>